So over here in the sports cubicle, we do like to get a little political. We've done this a bunch. And with the midterms coming up in, what, a week now, guys? Roughly? There's a lot at stake here. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about this a lot, but as three cis men here and not exactly doing a lot of research, we don't know a lot about this whole transgender athlete debate here. So I found someone, the, the professor of political science and women's and gender studies at Brooklyn College and the graduate center of the City University of New York and author of Sex Is As Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity. Yeah, Paisley Curra. So Paisley, thank you for joining us on the show today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So, Paisley, I want to talk right now. There are currently 18 states that have a transgender ban on athletes, especially the youth ones here. So I'm going to start with the big question that they keep accusing. Do transgender athletes have any advantage over cisgendered people? Well, the, the legislation that they've passed doesn't really speak to any particular problems. Like the legislation that they passed might be described as like a solution in term, a solution in search of a problem, because the legislation um, covers you know uh, school and college participation in sports, and um, when it comes to like elite sports, that's already governed by the whatever sports associations like swimming, tennis, you know, track and field. They have their own policies, and they're working through policies on transgender participation. So it's not necessary for legislatures to weigh in on that. So the the legis this legislation is really targeting like middle school and high school kids at the non elite level, and that is where it really is. Um, it's really just uh, a part of enrolling transgender people in the culture wars to uh, to create problems where none exists. Paisley, this is Mike here. Uh, I have this, you know, you gave us a lot of great info there kind of to get this conversation started. But for those who are just joining us, who are new to this subject matter, who well, there's a lot of nuance in this conversation. When we're talking about transgender and we're talking about athletes or just everyday life, are how do we quantify this? Is it by what people are taking by hormones or whether they've done a, a operation, have they done a transition? What When we're talking about transgender, I know it's a, a very big blanket umbrella statement but when we're in this subject matter, how will we define it? Right, that's a very good question, Mike. So when it comes to transgender um, transgender athletes, uh, the policies basically address um, the, the people's transition in relation to hormones. Um, like many transgender people have some sorts of surgery in, in terms of um, changing their genitals and so on, but that doesn't really have any effect on athletic performance, the shape of your genitals. So the, the policies really have got to do with um, um, uh, people's hormone levels or the policies that the sports, uh, the sports uh, uh, associations are addressing. Um, the, the legislation that the Republicans have passed are just about whether someone is transgender or not. And that's um, anybody who's transgender is just automatically in much of this legislation barred from participating. So the, the sports associations are much more... Um, have a much more sophisticated approach in terms of looking at, like, making sure that no one that the policies are as inclusive as possible, and no one has an unfair advantage. So, a common policy would be to say someone has to be on, you know, hormone depressing um, medication or hormones for a year or two before they can compete. And that's like a, a, a pretty common policy. Uh, but that's not what's happening in this legislation. How long do hormone blockers take effect? I, I see policies that require athletes that transition from male to female to take hormone blockers for at least a year before they're able to compete in, in women's sports. Is that too much time or is that an adequate amount of time for these hormone blockers to take effect? Well, you know, I'm not a medical person. I'm a political science policy person. So, but my understanding is that a year is a year is is pretty reasonable amount of time uh, to 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 require for the hormone blockers. The key thing is, I just wrote an op-ed in Nature. The key thing is there needs to be more studies on um, on the effects of hormone block blockers and more studies to compare cis women athletes with trans women athletes. Because a lot of the discourse and the rhetoric around the sports participation is about comparing men to women. Um, and what we really need to do is compare cis women to trans women and see if who has any unfair advantages. So, for example, trans women on hormone blockers, trans women might have gone through a male puberty and they might have bigger frames. And then people think, oh, well, they have their bigger, got bigger bones. But then if you, you know, go on hormone blockers and take hormones, 
then you have these bigger bones and then less muscle mass to carry those bones around. So there's ways in which trans women can be at a disadvantage. Um, so what we need is actually just much, you know, more studies on it and less and less rhetoric and politics. Paisley, this is something that I've kind of rattled around my brain since this conversation really came to the forefront, and it has now been something that we all have to do our part to make sure that we're having these conversations. And I, I wonder, misogyny in all this, because you talked about the transition from men to women's sports, and I think a lot of people, it, it comes down to that in the general public, you can't have this grown man going against petite women. How dare you? Do you think a lot of it, a lot of the pushback from the, the average Joe, the average person, and not somebody who's trying to do this for a political reason, but somebody who's just trying to have somebody who's trying to figure this out in this new changing world that a lot of it is based off of the idea that men are just more physically superior than women. Yeah, I think I think a certain kind of sexism about women's participation in sports underlays some of it. And I think with the people are con- Sometimes for people, the image that's conjured up is like, yeah, like you said, some grown person who looks like a grown man mm. competing against petite women. But that's that's really not the situation. Like someone who's transitioning and going on hormone blockers and taking hormones is not like a it's not like a cisgender grown man. Um, but I think misogyny comes into it in other ways, and it especially shows up in these bills that have passed. Um, in the legislatures, like for example, in Utah, they passed a bill. You can't. It's trans girls can't participate in girls teams, um, and a judge blocked the bill temporarily. But in the meantime, what we've learned is is that parents have requested investigations of um, of athletes who have have won events. So one girl, her gender was investigated through her school records, going all the way back to the first grade or all the way back to kindergarten, looking at her doctor's records. And she's just a cisgender girl. But the parents of the other girls who lost to her thought maybe there's something gender nonconforming about her, so she her gender had to be investigated. And that's how I see the larger effects of these bills. It's just like misogynistic. Like, I have a 13-year-old girl, and I mean, the idea that her gender would be investigated by a panel of Republican officials if she were to participate in sports as a cis kid would just mean she would never want to participate in sports. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit going, it goes beyond transgender kids in the system to like actually kind of investigating anybody who, you know, comes off as any way gender nonconforming. Now, Paisley, the big attack I see a lot is mostly on the trans girls and there are just probably just as many trans boys playing with cisgender boys here i never see the attack on the trans boys as much as the trans girls and you think it's a thing of misogyny or is it going back to like what mike said it's like oh well, men are just naturally bigger than women so that's a disfair advantage because um, it's on both sides let's be real here yeah, so definitely trans boys are playing in boys teams and so on, um, but there's no sense, there's, there's no kind of common sense that they have any advantage in those teams. So the legislation, almost all the legislation, is really directed to, toward trans girls, and it's directed um, towards the idea that like they are, are competing unfairly. So the trans boys just sort of drop out of it. But that doesn't mean that the anti-trans discourse that's fooling around in Republican legislatures doesn't have effect on, on trans kids of all genders. Um, but, but the trans the trans boys kind of just kind of fall out of the picture. It, it seems like with some of the legislation that has been passed, there's been uh, at least three cases of Republican governors vetoing bills that were brought forth by Republican dominated legislatures. Does it seem like that this is a, a national conversation that seems to be something where you're seeing a lot of people kind of change their minds or at least be a little bit now more open to the dialogue where we haven't seen them open to this dialogue maybe a decade ago? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Like in Utah, um, Governor Cox, who's a Republican, he vetoed the bill. He vetoed the bill and he gave this really incredible veto speech. He pointed out that there were 75,000 um, high school athletes in Utah and there was one transgender girl and uh, no questions have been raised about her participation. And he said, rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. And he vetoed the bill. 
and then the re- legislature came back and overrode his, his veto. But it, it does show that, like, when people are presented with, like, some evidence and um, expert testimony, they understand that the politics are really out of whack with what's going on in the ground in terms of, like, the the ability of, of kids to play teams. Because this is – a lot of people are worried about, like, the elite athletes, and the, the athletic associations are, like, looking at that. So really, a lot of these, this legislation is just about making sure some middle school kid can't play in the girls volleyball team like how, it's not really furthering any important governmental object, objective it's just about kind of fomenting transphobia and the culture wars if you're just tuning in we're talking to paisley Kura, the author of sex is as sex does governing transgender identity and mike you got a question paisley I, I, we're having this great conversation i just keep coming back to this whether it was colin kaepernick and the way donald trump used it or where we're at now with the transgender movement and making sure that everybody has their equal rights to play these sports that we love or just live life the way we should it seems to me that sports are just being used as a trojan horse for some of these just downright bigotry moves legislation that we've been hearing about you seeing this and doing some of these you know seeing these surveys and studies and statistics and in your teachings and studying and whatnot how much have you noticed that over the last five six seven years just sports being used to worm these these horrible bigotry moves that we've been seeing yeah, I think that's a really good point because a few years ago it was bathrooms and legis- anti-trans bathroom legislation, and then the, the new move has been to kind of sports le- sports legislation because it plays on people's fears of unfair competition, but it also it also shows that like sports play this bigger role in the culture than than sports itself. Like it assumes it assumes its incredible symbolic importance, and so uh, you know sports is uh, it's like the new uh, proving ground for transgender transgender Republicans. The uh, sorry, not transgender. Republicans, anti-transgender Republicans. Um, one of the things we've seen in public opinion is that public opinion on transgender people has generally been getting more and more positive every year. But recently, we've seen a bit of a partisan divide, like the Republicans are becoming a little bit less supportive of transgender equality. And that is a direct result of like the concerted messaging, um, the concerted anti-trans messaging that the Republicans are doing. And it's starting to, it's actually starting to have an effect because I think people are, are affected by the, by the, you know, the cable news networks and the messages they get from their elected officials. Uh, and what we should really be doing is kind of paying attention to the folks in our community and think, does that trans girl really need to be barred from the 10th grade intramural volleyball team? It's like, is that really a, a matter of vital national interest? Um, so I think that's, that's one of the problems we're seeing. Paisley, we really appreciate you making time for us and really enlightening us with this great conversation we'll, we, as we wrap up this this wonderful, this eye-opening conversation. I, I guess my my thing, and I, for anybody listening to the Sports Cubicle, what can we do? What's next in this movement to help our, not just our transgender athletes, but just those in our community going through these transitions and we're seeing so much attack towards them this election cycle. What is next for, you know, I know it's an overused term, but like allies, people who want to do better, whether they consider themselves an ally, what can they do? What is next process for us to try to really help out those that are going to need our help come November? Well, I think it's paying attention to what's happening at the local level, because that's where uh, that's where the Republicans are really good at activating their activists. So, for example, like local libraries getting rid of, of books around LGBT issues or school boards thinking about policies banning trans kids or make not banning trans kids, but making it impossible for trans kids to use the pronouns associated with their gender identity. In addition to whatever sports policies, like pay, pay, even if you don't have a trans family member of a trans kid, but like pay attention to what's happening in your school board because the right wing is very good at, at getting people to show up at those kinds of meetings. Um, and uh, the progressive progressive are not as good at that. So that would be a good way to be an ally. Paisley, we got one week till the midterm elections here. And we've been using this a lot, but this seems like another one of the most important elections of our lifetimes. And for just trans people right now, how important are these upcoming midterms? Well, they're so important because the Republicans at the federal level in Congress have, are proposing some incredibly draconian legislation. <laughs> Excuse me. Some legislation is like a, a kind of a don't say gay bill, a don't say LGBT bill at the federal level, which would ban any institution that receives any federal funding. 
which is like most schools and universities and, and other institutions, from ever using the words gender identity or transgender or LGBT or gay or sexual orientation in most of their work. And so that's a Republican bill that was introduced by Representative Johnson in Congress. And if they get the, if they get control of the House, that could, that could go forward and, and also the Senate. So it's really quite important that people um, pay attention and and, and, and show up uh, at the polls uh, next month. Paisley Kerr, author of The Sex Is As Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity. Paisley, if anyone wants to buy your book or find you on social media, where can they go? Well, they can buy that book at the usual suspects, but if you go to NYU Press, their website, and you put Curra30, C-U-R-R-A-H, then you get 30% off, and it's like 19 bucks. So uh, that's a nice way to buy it. <laughs> And they want to find you on the socials? Oh, socials, yeah. My name, uh, Paisley Kura on Twitter. Just like, it, it, no one in the world has my name. So if you could just <laughs> you can find me pretty easily. P-A-I-S-L-E-Y-C-U-R-R-A-H. Paisley, thank you so much for joining us right now. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you guys for listening to the Sports Cubicle today. You know, for the Paul Asius one, Paul Shivari, the marvelous one, Dan Marver, Mike Mercado, we need to get a nickname for you soon enough. I'm Devin Tingle here. Santia Jackson starts off your day at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. And I normally say have a good night, but today I'm going to say vote, 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 vote. Have a good night.